everyone. Welcome everyone again. We are live with Micah Hermsen. Welcome the audience uh, again. I hope you move from one lecture to the other. I can understand if you don't, but um, and yeah. Anyway, welcome everyone. Drop the comments that you're here in this one, that you moved from one broadcast to another. And uh, I, while I welcome Micah, and Micah, let you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do in the Computational Pathology Group. I'm going to quickly here go to YouTube and see if everybody is on the same page there. But Micah, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your research. Tell us about how you ended up in this group. Because you're also a little bit of an odd duck in the group. Most of the guys are uh, computer scientists. Couple are pathologists. You're neither. So tell us about that. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm a bit in between, indeed. So I. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maike Hermsen, and I'm a, a PhD student in the computational pathology group of Radboud UMC. Uh, and indeed, my background is a bit different from uh, most of the people in the group. So I have a background in um, laboratory science, actually, and I worked as a research technician for a long time, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and that was partially in this group and partially in a group that focuses on uh, renal pathology. And mm -hmm. um, I was always doubting if I wanted to pursue a PhD or, um, yeah, go a bit deeper into the stuff that, uh, that I was already doing. Um, and then a very interesting project came by, which was called the SysMIFTA project, um, which was uh, targeted at uh, the role of macrophages in um, kidney transplant rejection. Um, and uh, image analysis played a big role there. So it was a bit of both of my worlds. And so I started doing that. And um, well, when we started working on this project, we needed some deep learning applications um, to do our image and analysis. That's the topic of our talk. The topic yep. uh, of our talk is deep learning, and we're gonna give you an overview what it actually means, where it stands in different image analysis approaches. I see we have several people live already, so drop a comment, just to say hi. I know I'm asking you the same thing uh, in every broadcast to tell you where you're dialing in from, but just say hi if you've been with, with us for a couple of hours already. Just let me know. Uh, I see your comments and I know that you're there. Okay, so deep learning, Micah. Um, let's talk about that. And I have a couple of like guiding questions for for that, um, like what is deep learning? <laughs> First yeah. guiding question: What is deep learning? What is deep learning? Well, that's a, that's a broad question. No, I think uh, so. Deep learning, as most people know, is a branch of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we speak of deep learning, we actually speak of deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. So within the field of artificial intelligence, which um, you can find many of these diagrams online, by the way, but mm -hmm. when you talk about artificial intelligence, you talk about mimicking human behavior using a machine or a computer. And um, a diagram for us. In, uh, in, uh, in deep learning, the special thing about it, as I said, is that we work with neural networks. And these neural ne networks have the ability to self-teach. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the main um, special things about these deep neural networks is that they are uh, so they are based on uh, our own biological neurons. So the way the signal process through through the model that's kind of the same as our brains process information. Um, and the special thing about these deep neural networks is that they can learn from their mistakes. So you can basically Unlike see it. some of us. <laughs> <laughs> we should, but yeah, we don't we, always do. Well, the same as we do. Uh, I think they have to make the same mistake a couple of times. <laughs> mm -hmm. And by fine tuning, uh, they get better at the, at the task at hand. And um, I think the best way to see it is you have your, you have your input and the network or the model knows what you want to get out. For instance, um, a disease or a type of segmentation, it knows which answer you want to have. Um, mm -hmm. So you put your input through 
there you have this model of all these uh, of all these neurons. Input, or, we're, go, think... we're gonna talk about the input, right? Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, sorry. Finish your 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 thought first, and then I'm like, yeah. So the thing is, so it it uh, it's being processed, and then uh, something wrong comes out. That's how it works. First, mm -hmm. it makes a mistake, then it tweaks the network or the model a tiny bit, and then hopefully the performance improves. So then the network knows, okay, I did something right here with the settings of my neurons, and um, that that process of going back and forth between uh, input and output and learning from mistakes, that's called back propagation. And I think that's a very important item of, uh, of deep learning. Mm -hmm. Back propagation. Yeah. So that it goes back. So it has input, it has output. The output is compared to the input. And if it matches, great. If it doesn't match, it goes back and checks what to change to have a better uh, to have a better um Become closer result. to the truth so to say mm -hmm. yeah yeah so what is this input what can we put into this uh as our like what do we give this network to learn yeah um that can also be quite broad i'm going to talk about what i know best and those are images yes um and you have multiple ways to to tackle that so um and I think one of the uh, one of the applications that is mainly used is uh, giving masks to the network. Um, and so let's say you want to um, you want to detect or segment tumor inside um, lymph nodes, for instance. So when a patient gets uh, a breast cancer, uh, they take out the lymph nodes and they check if the lymph nodes are are clean. Uh, for any mm -hmm. metastases, so that's an important. And we mentioned part. this um, chameleon challenge that your group has um, worked on, 2016 yeah. and 17. So uh, that's something that was tackled with deep learning. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was not only tackled with deep learning; it was tackled because the 2016 that was like the year where they they started doing deep learning, maybe. And in 2017, so in the 2016, the models that uh, were not deep learning were still pretty highly performing. And then in 2017, all the winning models were deep learning. So basically what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And um, with that particular study, we created so-called masks, which means mm -hmm. that you very carefully delineate or click or um, let's call it delineate uh, the structure of interest. And you can convert that to a so-called mask. And that means that every pixel in the image gets assigned a certain class, a certain label. Mm -hmm. And we just talked about this with Leander in the previous one, like what um, what can you do like from computer vision standpoint with different, um, different like what are the computer vision tasks? Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be a type of input, basically an image where every pixel was uh, was assigned to a certain class. That can be mm -hmm. a type of a type of input. So you label this, uh, you label those classes. Your label is the input, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's always the case. Like the label is actually the input, together with the image. Um, and you can also only label the entire image so that you do mm -hmm. not say, okay, look at this or look at that, but look at the entire image. That gets complicated because then the network needs to see the entire image. Um, and that requires a lot of uh, a lot of memory and um, that's a bit of a different branch, but it's mm -hmm. definitely possible. So what types of deep learning do we have? We're talking now about giving a label, uh, like labeling stuff. But is this the only way we can do what? Like, is there what types of deep learning are there? Yeah, what I just uh, talked about that is so that you really delineate what you are interested in, and that you would like the network to do the same. Mm -hmm. That's called strongly supervised deep learning. So the name or actually already sets it, um, it's strongly supervised. So you uh, 
you tell exactly the, the network what to look for. You don't tell it, okay, this is what a tumor looks like, but you show it many, many examples and then, uh, then it learns. Um, you can also have weekly supervised deep learning. That's what I just mentioned, so that you have you have a label, but it's assigned to the uh, to the entire to the entire image. And uh, you also have the branch of unsupervised deep learning. I think you're you're also going to cover that. Uh, yes, and we're going to cover uh, weekly with Dan Geis, and uh, we're going to cover unsupervised with Geert Liekjens. So yeah. um, okay, so we have supervised weekly supervised and unsupervised uh, both supervised, supervised and weekly uh, they require labels right can you repeat it one more time the both the supervised deep learning and the weekly supervised learning they require labels the unsupervised yes. you don't have to give labels let's yeah. see what what uh, here tells about that yeah correct yes Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about the supervised. What? Uh, okay, so we can we can delineate uh, as labels. We can give a diagnosis as an image for the label. What are the labels in your project? Um, tell us a little bit about your project and like how deep learning. Are you you're doing supervised deep learning for your project, right? Yeah. So what what's your project and how are you labeling? Um, how does this work for your work? Yeah, I think initially in my projects, we figured out that we need kind of like a map of the whole kidney cortex. Mm -hmm. We want every structure to get a name. Uh, and that is because we were interested in these macrophages, as I told before, and we mm -hmm. wanted to know where they are in the tissue. Um, so then, yeah, we decided, okay, then we are going to need a, a network for that. So this was the first try. Um, of using it on, on kidney. There were some networks at the time uh, that were mainly focusing on the on the glomeruli, which are quite big standing out structures. But we were also interested in the tubuli and the interstitium and in the vessels, etc. So we'll add an image of a kidney uh, mm -hmm. while you're explaining and then we can we can show it. I have here our platform for oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so when we started off we were we weren't really sure how it was going to work. Um, but it worked actually quite nicely. Um, so we were we were pleased to see that. Um, and in my net of in my uh, in my study, we annotated uh, I think ten different classes in the in the kidney. Mm -hmm. And um, these were also the images that were shown to our model. So we uh, took a small piece of the of the kidney cortex and we annotated everything that was inside there. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, what, what are your classes for this? Uh, in our case, these were the glomeruli, the tubuli, and then we split up the tubuli into the, the proximal, the distal, and the atrophic uh, tubuli. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at interstitium. Um, we looked at sclerotic glomeruli, which is the completely scarred, um, the scarred glomeruli, which can happen when uh, you have limited um uh, bloodstream in the in the kidney that can happen mm -hmm. during rejection um our arteries and i believe the capsule so i have a biopsy of a kidney look mm -hmm. some good so these guys here are going to be tubules yeah. and we're looking at those images in path presenter oh here mm -hmm. is some glomerulus they yeah. don't look so beautiful Let me yeah annotate. And this is a, I think, a BS staining. Uh, sorry, this is an H&E staining, I think. Yes, H&E. Yes. Yeah, and we worked with uh, with uh, BS stainings because mm -hmm. those. So uh, yes, we, we talked about uh, special stains uh, with Leslie. PAS <laughs> is, um, yeah. Tell me why did you use PAS for kidney, and what, what do you see with with that bear? I'm gonna yeah, keep delineating a couple um, of bad glomeruli. BS really nicely uh, stains uh, some type of sugar groups, really dark pink, mm -hmm. and those are present in the basement membranes of the of the structures in the in the tissue, uh, which causes a very very nice delineation of all the tubules and also the glomeruli. Yeah, so I'm and gonna like try to annotate a basement membrane. 
Yeah. Basement membrane is like a you, and H and E you don't see it so well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there, and this is like a membrane the cells sit on. So uh, definitely very nice for uh, segmentation because you basically get a line around your structure. Yeah, mm -hmm. you are already helping your your network a bit when when you when you have a PES. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that it does is that um, you have different segments in the tubule uh, and the proximal part that has a brush border and the PES staining also reacts with, with that. So it kind of gives some extra information to the network. And uh, the second reason that we chose that uh, was because in, in, the, in the kidney field, the, the h and &E is always made, but I don't think it's used that much, maybe for some viral diseases. Uh, it can be informative, but mm -hmm. mainly the pathologist uses PES or a type of silver staining. Mm -hmm. um, and silver staining is also very informative. Uh, but what we've heard from people is that this staining is quite unstable. So it's very sensitive for changes in the protocol. And that's why we chose to use PES because I'm not sure if you have talked about that with someone already, but we see lots of variations already between labs and between scanners, um, which can be difficult if your network or if your model was trained on one subset, then mm -hmm. it might not work on the other one. We're going to have a, a special talk about that after lunch with Christina. Uh, okay. But yeah, totally like address whatever... Um, your challenges were. Uh, if we have a talk about it, I'm going to be jumping in and saying there's going to be a next talk. Uh, if we don't, then that's uh, something I will ask my audience to say, yeah, prepare a talk on that. That gives us in inspiration for more cool content for you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you use PAS because um, does the PAS show this variability across labs as well, or does it diminish the variability that you would yeah. see in H and E? Yeah, no. PAS also shows that variety between labs, um, but it's a bit more stable than the than the silver. That's why we just mm -hmm. decided to to go for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the um, so you have those ten classes that basically segment everything in the that there is in the kidney. Uh, what what do, the, so. yeah. what do you do with the results like uh, what's the why did you decide even to do this project what are you what yeah are, what, are, what mm -hmm. are you trying to do with it that's a good question um so in the end we used it uh well to perform quantifications on certain structures that are present um so my project is on uh, transplant kidneys and uh in this, uh, in this field, you have a type of classification system. It's called the Banff classification system, probably known by many pathologists here. Um, and that system is one big list of quantifications of counting structures, uh, determining percentage percentages of certain structures, etc. cetera. Um, so when, first, we, we only designed it for the, the macrophage project. Okay, we want mm -hmm. to localize the macrophages and where are they? But then we saw that it worked so nicely that we felt like, okay, no, we we should move on. We should continue with this as well and uh, not only um, use it for this particular research project, but see what other applications we can use it for. And then mm -hmm. we thought of this band classification system. Uh, so on one hand, we started using it to... Uh, um, quantitatively assess certain structures in the kidney. Um, and we are now also working on localizing uh, lymphocytes inside the kidney and where they are, because this is also important for this band classification. This is part of the scoring as well? Yeah, yes, yeah, this is also part of it. It's a bit more difficult, I must say, but um, it's something that we are working on, yeah. Mm -hmm. So question, you said that you started doing image analysis or you were like getting involved before you joined the group as a PhD candidate, right? Yeah, I worked as a technician for the computational pathology group, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you work uh, for them when you were not doing deep learning yet? Did you use any kind of classical computer vision, uh, classical approaches? Yeah. And and, and what, what was your... Um, experience with that as um, 
a let's say technology user and there are many um even though you're uh, like in the minority of your group uh, in the audience we have many people who are from the life science uh, part of things life science part of things but not really pathologists and they are doing image analysis but they're not really coding the stuff they are using tools so they're mm -hmm. like part of this bridge of the continuum which i think you're part of the group and if anybody is um like an image i call them image analysis scientists they are not pathologists, not computer scientists, but they're doing image analysis and they have to have an, a lot of understanding of tissue and a lot of understanding of the computer vision tasks, even if they're not really creating their own tools. Um, so what tools were you using before? Were they coding for you? Um, and what? so where I'm getting with this is like, what's the difference between classical and deep learning? Uh, are you even still doing anything in, with classical? Like, is there a combination or um, not? Everything moved to deep learning. And what did you see there as the main advantage? What What did you see as like, oh, that's so much better than uh, we used to see it? Hmm. Um, I did use classical, uh, what we call as image processing techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I used one of the most famous ones, and that's uh, image code. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, oh, I forgot the name. Oh, Fiji. I said image code. That's Fiji. Fiji. Image code is a viewer. Well, no, we also exactly. have some. Fiji, yes. Yeah. Fiji is a... Fiji. Um, that's what I use a lot. Um, we actually image have one J. Image in J our in... Fiji. That's Sorry? Image, image J. J. Image yeah. J and Fiji is like the same thing Fiji. in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we actually have one person in our group who, who is really an expert in um, uh, in Fiji, and uh, he also still gets a lot of assignments. So for I think Fiji, for using Fiji, and we have a comment Fiji, that yeah. uh, we have a pathologist uh, it's, who uses this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think many people use it in research, and I think if you're um, it really depends on the on the application. Um, I think so. AI got really popular. Uh, I think rightfully so. It's it's very useful and very robust. Um, but it can also be a bit of an overkill for the task mm -hmm. you are doing. So I think it's good as a researcher to talk to deep learning researchers, but also to people who do the the, the normal image processing techniques and then decide what fits your project best. I think one of the downsides of, um, of using tools like ImageScope is that it's still quite laborious. So you, you, it's, it's more quantitative, of course, than doing it uh, by eye. Um, it's more reproducible, definitely, but still there's quite um, um, objective, uh, a subjective component there because you have to tweak a lot with the thresholds and yeah your results basically depend on, on what threshold that you use yeah and i have seen this as a big drawback of this because um then you're like always at one or the other end of the threshold and you leave data on the table that you often visually are seeing, but that's like the best you can do. And um, we have a comment from Joachim that uh, for him, nuclear segmentation was something where AI was so much better. Yes, you, you don't have to set the threshold for roundness anymore, color, dark, mm -hmm. or whatever. You give examples, right? Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. That, that was the, the tough part for me as well. I worked before... Um, I supported, and I was like in a similar situation like you. I was supporting uh, computer scientists with like my pathology background, right? Uh, so I was not coding those tools, but I was reviewing the uh, quality of the algorithms. And then we would like go through a set of thresholds and nothing was satisfying, but mm -hmm. that was the best you could do. So uh, definitely, uh, yeah definitely it uh, it is something that was a game changing changer yeah um i think where, where one task where i saw a really strong difference 
was mm -hmm. in uh, quantitating um, images that were stained using immunohistochemistry. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I think many people that were interested in uh, quantifying number of uh, lymphocytes, for instance, they stained the slide using a CD3 marker, and then um, they just determined the amount of brown pixels using, using image scope. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as many people know, DAP is, so that's something that's used a lot for immunohistochemistry. That's quite sensitive for how long you leave it on, uh, on the tissue, the, the deeper brown your tissue gets. Uh, you can get some background staining. And as a human, you can say, oh no, this is background. Uh, this, this doesn't count. But in, yeah, Fiji doesn't know, it just counts the, mm -hmm. the brown pixels. Um, and I think with deep learning, uh, one of my colleagues developed a network there that works really nicely, and she just showed it thousands and thousands of examples of positively stained lymphocytes. Um, and then the network could really, all, I think that's another advantage, the network could really say, uh, or could detect individual lymphocytes, um, but also just, in, yeah, more accurately, I think, than, than something like that. Mm -hmm. I just saw a question coming by. I didn't want to run over. It. No, okay. This is a comment from uh, from Marcos. Would you be happy to have certain image processing tasks to be solved in camera in order to optimize image for your neural networks? If yes, I would be happy to learn more. Do you do you have any? Uh, can you comment on that one? Mm -hmm. I I think um, I think uh, Marcus means the the camera of the scanner. I think yeah. I guess that's, uh, that's what he means. Um, we are working on that, on color normalization, so mm -hmm. to say. I wouldn't put it in the camera of the scanner because uh, everybody has a different wish and then I think that would be an expensive, um, expensive way to go. But um, yeah, we do work on, we have worked on color normalization and also that you can use in different ways. You can use it. So let's say you have your network. It was trained on a certain subset of images. And then um, you can take a new set and normalize that into the color uh, spectrum of the set that you have already used before or what the network was uh, was used on. Um, another way it, uh, you can use it is to um, bring more variation to your training data. So. Mm -hmm. uh, by doing that, you can tweak the colors of your of your images and then show a different, yeah, or a broader range of images and, and colors uh, to your network. I think that would be the better way to go than to start normalizing everything. Uh, mm -hmm. In the end, I think you would like to have a network that's just as robust as possible. Because and then you will have cases from different labs coming in. Uh, and if you artificially uh, like increase the range of what your network has already seen on the data that you can, then you're not surprised when something within this range comes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. We know, yeah, go ahead. And then I have another question. No, I just wanted to mention that, that we do that. Um, that, that, that something that's kind of standardly done when we train our networks is called data augmentation. Uh, so that you tweak your images a tiny bit to create more robustness. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a comment from Francesco. Something for quality assessment would be nice to integrate in the camera itself, uh, running very close to the camera in the scanner. And let me tell you, I know companies that they're uh, doing it like that. Uh, one company is Pramana that basically does quality control of the slides while they are being scanned. So uh, yeah, that, that would be a super cool application for me as well. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask you, Maike, we now know, okay, classical, you always leave something at one end of the threshold. So you like wanna just get rid of the threshold and have it better without the threshold. So this is the deep learning and this is the supervised deep learning when instead of the threshold, we give examples. The, what is, annoying you about supervised deep learning? What are the challenges that you are still encountering in your kidney project? Like, what are the sticky points? Uh, because I like went through this um, transition of, oh, threshold sucks. 
let's do random forest and then i see random forest sucks for whatever i wanted to do as well let's deep learning and then deep learning was fantastic for a period of time for me till i saw that it also has limitations <laughs> So I want to ask you about the limitations that you see for supervised deep learning in, in your work. Yeah. Um, so the supervised deep learning is the one where you delineate everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's still quite some manual labor, labor involved. Um, you, yeah, deep, deep neural networks, they learn from getting many, many examples. Um, usually the more, the better. Mm -hmm. um, at some How point, many glomeruli just... did you have to annotate? Did you ever count it for your yeah. model to to perform as it performs now? That's a that's a good example because for glomeruli, uh, we saw that it um, that it already reached its top performance quite quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I have to I have to guess a bit, but I I think like around. 50 glomeruli or something is ready enough for an effort. Really? To, yeah, you, you really don't need that much. Then you but, expect that anything else, 50 is enough, right? And then it doesn't turn out that way. Yeah, but for instance, um, um, I think uh, the lab from uh, Peter Bohr, I, I can look up the, uh, the publication. They really looked specifically on uh, different structures in the kidney and they checked how much they needed for the for the uh, for the performance to kind of reach its its top, and um, yeah, it's not surprising because you see that the the uh, the structures that are difficult for us to recognize are also difficult for the network to recognize. And glomerulus. Yeah, I think that's a super super uh, important statement. What's not ex do not expect the uh, supervised deep learning to be better that you visually are because it's still you delineating the structures and for glomeruli especially uh, with the PAS staining where you have a nice membrane around the glomerulus this is like where you trace right so 50 of these if the membrane is intact you have a good solution which uh, um, structure was the most difficult where did you have to like tweak most and then we can address the uh, the question that we have but which structure from the 10 classes, or you have, you said you had over 10 classes, which one was the worst to work with? I think um, without a doubt, the atrophic tubuli. That's quite difficult because it's uh, it's a transient process. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not that a tubuli from one moment to the other, all of a sudden is atrophic. It's, yeah. It's a gradient, so also... Yeah, how did you human... approach that? Because there are many lesions that are a gradient, and there is a middle of this where a pathologist or a tissue expert looks at it and is like, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe not. How did you approach annotating of the annotation? And obviously, if you're not sure, the network is not going to be sure, but I want to know yeah. how, how you decided. Like, did you have criteria or...? Um, yes, we have criteria. Uh, so based on size and the thickness of the of the basement membrane, um, atrophic tubuli shrink and their their basement membrane thickens. So that was something that we paid attention to. But what you would like to do, um, of course, if I make a network only by myself, then yes, the network is probably not going to do better than I do. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do when you start training a network is include many many experts and mm -hmm. um, have multiple people do the annotation and have multiple people do the, the checking of the annotation so that you can get like basically the wisdom of multiple people into your into your network and mm -hmm. that way it can still outperform um a single person humans. yeah mm -hmm. a, a single person yeah okay before we wrap up anything else that you were disappointed uh, with deep learning or that you're like keep seeing and thinking ah there must be a better way oh um good question well if I nothing think comes to mind I, that's okay well that that's a good that's a, i think that's a good sign uh i think one thing is that um you still have a threshold 
Mm -hmm. People might not be aware of that, but all the way at the end, you have your the results of your network and you still want to say, okay, when does the network call something positive or not? Um, and that is something that can still be tweaked. So there you still have a, a, a level of, of subjectivity. I think that was, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But I really had to think for that one. So. Good, that means that. You know that it's not that bad it's good actually that's why you're using it and that's why you're doing your phd with this thank you so much for joining us uh and and for everyone who joined us as well um before we get off i want to remind you guys that uh, you can get the certification for uh, being here with us so send us a dm on linkedin for if you need a certificate or if we somehow you cannot send us a link in messages. Um, ah, and we have a, still a comment, sorry. So uh, let's do some maintenance and then we go to the comments and then we say goodbye. So certifications are out there. And I have heard from my team that we have a problem with the LinkedIn broadcast for the, of the next lecture, but YouTube and Facebook are working well. So if in doubt, if like on LinkedIn somehow it is canceled, it should not be canceled. Uh, the next one is actually about weekly supervised deep learning with Dan Heis, who already joined us before. If for any reason, those who are still hearing me on LinkedIn are trying to join on LinkedIn and if it's not working, go to YouTube. There is, um, you should have this in your email as a reminder, click the YouTube one and you're going to be able to join us. And, and I'm going to like welcome all the LinkedIn people uh, from YouTube there. And let's uh, look at this comment that uh, is there. Which one is the most important in digital pathology, supervised or unsupervised? So I, I'm going to comment um, maybe from a pathology from the community acceptance perspective. The easiest to understand is supervised. And that was like the first thing that the pathology community started working with. Um, and I, I see it as still having the biggest presence and because of that being most important at the moment, whether it's going to be most important in the long end, I think pathologists and, and uh, tissue experts are pretty fed up with annotating. If you have to do 50 glomeruli, that's fine. But if you have to do at 2000 of tubuli and you have to like ask yourself oh where do i draw the threshold uh, that's a bottleneck michael what do you think yeah i totally agree I'm not sure if this is me but the, like the volume seems to go down all of a sudden um but that's that's nothing uh yeah i totally agree i think the level of acceptance is uh, is i think already high in the mm -hmm. in the supervised uh, one because it's also it's really clear you can see what the network looked at um but um when people talk about ai they also talk a lot about discovering new patterns that can be important and then i think the like the, the unsupervised yeah, yeah can good. give us new new insights very good point yeah. we're used to what we know and we're leveraging that but there's so much that we don't know thank you Micah, for joining us thank you everyone thank you for joining me. us in this broadcast and i'm gonna welcome you in the next one but actually i'm not gonna welcome you there uh, in person like that because this was a pre-recorded so once again if you're on linkedin and you're trying to join on linkedin and it doesn't work go on youtube thank you so much thank you <laughs> Bye bye, bye, -bye.